Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be starting off my review of Bit of a Blur by Alex James. So Alex James is the bassist in Blur, he's also a cheesemaker. Uh, let me read you the blurb to you and then I'm going to check out some of my tabs. I was the full king of Soho and the number one slag in the Groucho Club, the second drunkest member of the world's drunkest band. This was no disaster though, it was a dream coming true. For Alex James, music had always been a door to a more eventful life. But as bass player of Blur, his journey was more exciting and extreme than he could ever have predicted. In Bit of a Blur, he chronicles his journey from a slug-infested flat in Camberwell to a world of screaming fans and private jets, and his search to find meaning and happiness, and perhaps most importantly, the perfect cheese, in an increasingly surreal world. So there's this great quote here, he says, Really, no band is ever any more sophisticated an arrangement than that. A, gr a group of people who enjoy making a loud noise together, despite their differences. And I just thought this was interesting because, as you guys know, I've been trying to learn French. I loved girls, music and France. I fell for France on holiday and on French exchanges. I went to Germany too, but they just wanted to play table tennis. In France, everything was exotic, erotic, dangerous and fabulous. Cool women on mopeds smoked cool cigarettes and knew about cheese and poetry. I liked reading too, but writers themselves didn't seem to be very appealing people until I turned over a school copy of L'Etranger by Albert Camus in the first year of the sixth form. There was a picture of Albert on the back. Jetain glowing from the corner of a silky pout, long skinny Mac and James Dean hair. It said on the flap that he played football in goal for Algiers. Okay, so in chapter two, still quite close to the beginning, we get introduced to a familiar face, I guess if you're a Blur fan, you know? Uh, Goldsmith College said they'd have me after all, despite my recent lack of form, and I set off for London a year late to start a French degree. Someone else was getting his stuff out of his parents' car when I arrived at the student halls of residence with my own parents. I saw him unload a guitar. He was covered in paint, but even if he hadn't been, it would have been obvious that he was an art student. Pale and skinny, national health specs, huge trousers and a stripy, baggy jumper. It's a moment that I remember very clearly. I liked him from the instant I saw him, and I had the certain feeling that one of the main characters in my life had just walked onto the stage. His name was Graham Coxon, and he had the room above me, but I didn't see him again for a few weeks. He had friends who were in their final year, and he spent his time with them. I thought this was great characterisation as well, assuming you can call something characterization when it's about a real person, you know? It was through Jason and Paul that I got to know Graham. The art department was a members club, really. The artists didn't mix with the rest of the college. I got to know Paul in the kitchen. He was on first name terms with the abstract expressionist, but he had no idea how to feed himself. I had a year of low budget culinary experimentation behind me. He'd come straight from his mum's. He didn't know how pasta worked and was quite spellbound by tomato puree. He had an artist's fascination with the mundane. There was something magical for him in a tube of tomato puree, a tomato being transformed into its essence and represented as a packaged consumer product. Was it more of a tomato or less now? Was it art? Was it good on toast? Jason waded around in the primary flavours like they were huge splashes of bold colour. He always put too much garlic in. His drawings were very dense. So I thought this was pretty cool here because they talk about a band called Teardrop Explodes and a guy called Julian Cope who was their frontman. He was from Tamworth, which is the same town that I grew up in. Some of the songs were supposed to hurt. Andy's partner, Dave Balf, didn't like those very much, he said at the bar afterwards. He asked lots of questions and said we were mainly rubbish, but very occasionally brilliant. All that we knew about Dave Balf was that he had been the keyboard player in the Teardrop Explodes. He was in his mid-thirties and he talked and looked like a mad headmaster. I liked him straight away. I loved the Teardrop Explodes. I thought this was kind of funny. Um, he said, It's hard to say what a producer does. He's sort of in charge, like an architect on a building site. But he's your architect and you have to make sure he's building your castle and not his. I thought this was kind of interesting too because if you're a musician you can probably relate to this I guess. There is something very ear catching about the same thing repeating, a hypnotic perfection. 8 beats is quite a small amount of time, but it is actually long enough to change the course of popular history if you get it exactly right. Making good loops is no easier than playing well through the whole song. In fact, it puts even more emphasis on the feel. Feel is the subtle quality that separates the great players from the ordinary ones. It's largely innate, like a person's way of walking or talking. A hundred different guitarists will all play the same riff in exactly 100 slightly different ways. The subtle pushing and pulling at the rhythm, the exact lengths of the notes and how hard the strings are hit and bent mean that no riff is ever quite the same in different hands. Things played with clinical accuracy often sound quite lifeless and mechanical. If it feels good, it is good. So this was good as well, this talks uh, about the role of the manager. We still didn't have a manager and we needed one. A good manager understands how record companies work. He knows a good sync license fee from a bad one and he is always on the phone bollocking someone about mechanical royalties in the minor territories. That's what a manager should be doing. Fighting battles you don't understand so that you can float around getting drunk and shagging. A management company is similar to a record company. They work alongside each other. 
They generally get along great and help each other. The rub is always with someone in business affairs at the label. That's the record company's legal department. No one in the world cares about business affairs departments except for managers. Managers care about them all day. As an artist, you would hope never to meet anyone from business affairs. Life is too short. That's why you pay your manager 20% of everything to deal with them. Most people who work in record companies are pretty cool. They all love music. You'd have to. Hello, camera change. I'm very sorry. Uh, but I left my camera in Tamworth, so I'm having to film on my phone at the moment, which could be interesting because I don't know if there's even enough space for me to do this full review, but we'll take it one step at a time. So I thought this little insight was quite fun. I mean, if you know my surname, you will understand why. At Syndrome, it was fashionable to drink Perno with everything, and as the drinks flowed, all the bands got to know each other. It was a scene. As soon as we'd finished recording There's No Other Way, we took it straight to Neil's night at Syndrome, like all the other bands did. Neil used to put the records on and dance madly to them on the empty dance floor. He was really talented at picking good songs. Someone should have given him a record company to run, or a radio station, but all he really wanted to do was flap his arms around to New Music all night. We stood at the bar waiting for the reaction of the test audience of die-hard, late-night indie kids. Lush were at the bar. So were Ride. They were eager to hear if our new record was as good as theirs. It was much more nerve-wracking than Jukebox Jewelry. Chapter House, who was supposed to be better than all of us that week, were listening carefully, and Moose, who Graham really liked, and Spitfire, and Slow Dive, and Swade, and an unassuming American guy called Kurt and his girlfriend Courtney. I thought this was a pretty cool little quote here. He said, uh, having nothing is quite relaxing. Being alive and in the middle of the chase was all that mattered. You can live without chairs, but you can't live without dreams. He also said, the tragedy of getting what you want is that when you do actually get it, you always lose what you had. This is quite a fun little insight into what happened when they were on tour as well. Uh, back at the venue, things weren't going so well. The dressing room was the smartest, newest, cleanest one we'd had on the whole tour, and Damon and Dave had demolished it. They'd taken the ceiling down and were starting on the walls. At some time previously, there had evidently been a food fight and a beer throwing contest. The people from the radio station had come along to hang out and thought it was brilliant. I went out to the bar with Damon. We were celebrating his birthday and being number one in Canada. There was a bottle of Tabasco on the bar for Bloody Marys. He said, watch this and neck the whole thing. Temporarily, he went into convulsions and was sick. Then the hiccups started. They were the biggest hiccups I've ever seen. There was an element of sneeze in each hiccup and each one possessed his entire body. It wasn't deadly serious, but we were supposed to be on stage in 20 minutes. We went on late. I smashed a guitar and a few drums. Having destroyed backstage, Damon tore into the front of house. Dave Swan dived into the crowd and was devoured, so I finished the drums off. We hadn't done that for a while. It is very satisfying to make a lot of noise and break stuff. I thought this was quite cool here. He's talking about the album Modern Life is Rubbish, and he says, The scope of the album was vast. We were all listening to different music and pulling in different directions. Musical differences are often cited as the reason bands disintegrate, but they are actually what makes a good group great. And here I thought this was cool as well, he talks about a gig they did in Sweden, he says, We had decided to start the set with one of the songs we just demoed called Girls and Boys. Dave accelerated his bass drum to the disco tempo, 120 beats per minute. There is something special about that tempo. It's supposed to make your heart beat faster. Mine was thumping. The keyboard crept in with the bass drum. I flicked my fringe and slammed in with the bass. It was the first time we'd played the song. The crowd went absolutely berserk. They went bananas. They were entranced, ecstatic, 20,000 of them. By the last chorus, they knew the words and were singing along. Our lives changed forever during those three and a half minutes. It brought the place down. There were bras flying onto the stage and grins everywhere you looked. People were shouting for B-sides and screaming our names. It was quite a short set. We finished with There's No Other Way and went off. They were screaming for an encore, so we went back on and sang the frog song again and tried another new song called Park Life. I, I like this bit as well. Uh, he says, obviously I'm learning French. Got to throw that in every time. There were a few shows in the French provinces. Word was getting around that we had some good songs. I like French people. I was, running, I was wandering around Rennes on a Sunday afternoon and some cool looking French guys approached me and asked me in very bad English if I was Alex James. They were surprised when I replied in French. We tore around in their old Renault. They showed me the cathedral and we went back to their house. French people love showing you their cathedrals. They made me a souffle and introduced me to Apollinaire, a romantic poet I'd missed. They insisted I kept the volume of poems and we went to a bar. We picked Graham up on the way. They called some girls they knew and I spent an enchanted evening playing Belot to the French national card game with the barman. There was something very comfortable about that level of celebrity. When things started to go really crazy, I lost the privilege of just bumping into people, going to their homes and having a peaceful, ordinary time. But I enjoyed that day. I was welcomed like a brother, not a rock star. These were people just like me, with the same interests. I never saw them again, but it was delightful to step into their lives for a moment. Here, we, uh, here he talks about some of his favourite champagnes as well. He says, I started on the Monopole. Monopole is one year old plonk and good for mixing, but I soon developed a taste for Tatinger. That's quite crispy and biscuit flavoured. I found Bollinger and Moe a bit yeasty. 
Tatinger was just a phase and I settled on Cordon Rouge. I got three bottles of that in the rider every day for about five years, but I supplemented it with a systematic tour of all the great champagne houses. Krug, Dom Perignon, La Verve, all colours, all sizes, all years. On special occasions, or given the choice, I went for Cristal. That was my favourite. It's in a clear bottle that has a very delicate flavour, a liquid gold that transmogrified into sizzling suds on my tongue and left me thinking about violets. So uh, I'm going to read these little bits out here as well. So this is about Song 2. He said, Song 2 was about the simplest thing we've ever done, and the quickest. Dave set up two drum kits, and he and Graham played them both at the same time. The loud guitar in the chorus is actually a bass going through a homemade distortion box. The whole thing was done in about 15 minutes. I had a bad hangover and I felt horrible. It's a nasty record, and it wouldn't have sounded so nasty if I'd gone to bed early the night before. We did it without thinking too much about it and felt better afterwards. And then he tells the story of, um, they won an Ivan Novello award and then they took it into a bar and were drinking and this guy in the bar was like, oh, I've got one of those. And he went back home and brought it out and he did. He talks about the pressures of fame and I thought this was a great quote. Living behind a familiar face is like driving a flash car. There are always some people who want to put a big scratch in it and you have to be careful where you park. And he talks about Damien Hurst as well because they all went to college with him and, um, yeah, like they... You know, they ended up kind of watching each other's rise to fame and glory, you know. He says here, I thought as a rock star I owed it to people to enjoy myself to the absolute limit. It was a missed opportunity for everybody if I didn't. Turpitude, extreme immorality, is the privilege of the rock star. No one else would get away with it. Even film stars and footballers have to conduct themselves with some degree of common decency. They're all answerable to somebody. Making music is a self-indulgent business and success is just more wood for the bonfire. Absolutely every proper rock star in history has gone through a phase of self-indulgence of proportions inconceivable to the rest of the population. That's kind of what a rock star is. It would be dull to just turn up and play some songs and leave. It's not what everybody wants. There's nothing profoundly evil about what goes on backstage. It's just mucky. I thought this quote was pretty funny. He says, The first instruments were drums, probably mammoth schools, bashed with mammoth bones. Not much has changed in the drum world. And then, because he's kind of into science and stuff, he's actually helped to fund an attempt to land on Mars. He ended up getting sent to interview Patrick Moore. I thought this was interesting. Um, so during the interview, I'd been wondering what shape the universe was. I'd kind of got to thinking it was hyperspherical and I'd been drawing hyperspheres a lot and staring at them. I asked him what sort of shape he thought it all was. He said he'd asked Einstein the same thing and Einstein didn't know either. And he also said the first man to walk on, the, on Mars has probably already been born. He talked about air shows as well because he also learned to fly a plane. Actually him and the drummer can both fly. He says, there is a thrill of vulnerability at all air shows. There is no way of making everything completely safe. When the machines are being thrashed to capacity and the pilots are flying at their limits to dazzle, things are bound to go wrong sometimes. There have been some historic disasters, but the danger is a part of the attraction. What I didn't realise is that uh, he also wrote the song Vindaloo, which was recorded by Fat Les. It was uh, a football song. Is that one that goes, Vindaloo, Vindaloo, na na? Yep. And here we have a reference to the Hellfire Club, which I think is interesting because that happened here in Wickham. And funnily enough, I'm actually currently writing a short story that taps into the Hellfire Club's mythology. And he's talking about Vindaloo here. It was a marching band, really, and Keith marched in with his goat at the head of the procession. We got onto the stage and the drumming started. The bass comes in on the chorus. I windmill my arm around histrionically for the first note and, as my finger hit the one and only string, it snapped. I didn't have any spares. It's really unusual to snap a bass string, particularly when it's the only one you've got, and the bass is the only instrument. No one seemed to mind. Actually, it sounded more like it did on the terraces with just drums and voices. England won, so the party rose out of control to extravagance. Forget the 60s. In the summer of 1998, London was in the grip of a hedonistic fervour not seen since the days of gin houses and the Hellfire Club. I thought this was another little quote that I, I highlighted on as well. It's something I need to try to remember, you know? We spend so much of our lives underwhelmed by the ordinary. It is hard to remember that life is a constant miracle in a vast, unexplored universe full of secrets. And here he says something I kind of disagree with because I'm a bit of a night owl, but um, yeah, he's talking about London. He says, at night the city belonged to all the people who didn't have to get up in the morning. Musicians, artists, actors, models, criminals, the, ar the aristocracy, the insane, drug dealers, wheeler dealers, comedians, drug addicts, the fabulously rich, writers, a random bag of all ages, creeds and classes. I never knew whether I was going to meet a murderer next or the most beautiful woman in the world. People only stay up all night for three reasons. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's not the best time for getting things done. I get so much done at night. He mentions at one point that he'd been a vegetarian for 17 years, although he kind of implies towards the end that he's no longer vegetarian, I don't know. So yeah, here he talks about this some more, and he also talks about something I've had experience of when you go abroad and you try and eat food. 
I'd been a vegetarian for 20 years. I'd fought my way around the restaurants of the world, sending things back that had bacon sprinkled on them or chicken stock in them, enduring many a plate of overboiled vegetables and the disdain of proud chefs everywhere. Japan was the most difficult place to fulfill the vegetarian dream. I had taken special training to make sure I could order vegetarian food in Japan, but it's complicated. Vegetarianism is just not a notion to the Japanese. You have to explain the whole concept every time you order a bowl of noodles. Still, more often than not, it would be a disaster. I'm sure this is fish, I said to the girl from the record label, holding up a morsel with my chopsticks. No, not fish, she said. What is it then? It's made from fish. It's not fish. It was hopeless. And then I guess this is uh, where he talks about deciding to eat meat again. I don't know. <laughs> I think my vegetarianism stemmed from a wish to take a benevolent but passive role in nature. That role changed when we moved to the farm. You can't be a passive farmer. I had no idea what was going on. It was 200 acres of unknowns. I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't found Paddy. Paddy is a kind of farming advisor called a land agent. It's the equivalent of a manager in show business, or, probably more accurately, someone who you pay to be your dad. Paddy walked all over the land with us, inspecting fences, hedges, ditches, weed infestation levels. He appraised the state of the roofs and gutters around the farmyard. He applied for grants. He told me to see so-and-so about such and such. He took care of the business, and I learned a lot from him very quickly. He said we had to do something about the rooks. They were taking over. Rooks eat all the other birds' eggs, so unless you keep them under control, you end up with just rooks. The West End is teeming with rodents. There were heart-stopping rats bigger than cats in Endell Street. Mercer Street was more mouse and pigeon territory. Rentakill would come and put their traps down, and that would take care of it, but there's no easy way to deal with rooks. The only way to control them is to shoot them. It was a very difficult situation for a vegetarian. In the end, I resigned myself to the fact that you're being a lot more benevolent with a 12 bore than you are when you order the nut roast. It was a short step from whacking rooks to munching on a bacon sandwich. So yeah, overall, I thought it was pretty interesting. I would have liked it to have covered more of the recent years as well, because it's not super up to date. I think it ended about 2004. But yeah, it was pretty cool. There were some photos in it as well. I would say if you're a Blur fan, definitely check it out. If you've never heard of Blur, I don't know why you would read it. But um, yeah, it was pretty good for a, like a celebrity musician autobiography. I gave it like a 3.75, maybe a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of A Bit of a Blur by Alex James. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.